Jazakallah khairan Ridwan Shiva the highly listening that was beautiful reading MashaAllah what is better to start a meeting with than the word of Allah the Almighty we have tonight the pleasure of having Sheikh Didat with us in Copenhagen one more evening for another interesting topic tonight's topic is the whether the Bible is the word of God and tonight it will not be a debate it will be Sheikh Ahmed Didat lecturing us on whether the Bible is the word of God or not and as it is not a debate we have no counterpart to take into consideration so I suggest we give Sheikh Didat completely free hands to end his speech whenever he feels he has said what he has to say Sheikh Ahmed Didat Mr. Chairman, my dear brothers and sisters, the verdict has already been given. I read to you an ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah, from the Holy Quran, in which Allah Ta'ala reminds us that woe to those who write the book with their own hands and they say, this is from Allah. That they may reap some small benefit. So woe to them for what their hands do write, and bow to them for what they earn. The verdict is given by Allah that this is something that they have concocted with their own hands. But when we are reasoning with people, we have to reason with them. We can't just say, my book says, yours is not from God, finish and over. No, we have to reason with them. So in reasoning with them, we may ask them, in answer to the question, is the Bible God's word? We say, which Bible are you talking about? We say, no, the Bible. I say, yes, what Bible? Look, I have on the table here, one, two, three, four Bibles. And believe me, each and every one is different. It says, Holy Bible, Holy Bible, Holy Bible, Holy Bible. Each and every one says, Holy Bible, but they are all different. Which one? So I asked Pastor Stanley in Stockholm, which one you want me to discuss as the word of God? He said, no, no, no. When my turn comes, I will tell you. Well, you can't force anything out of a person. But he spoke for an hour, but he never touched the subject. The first question I asked was, which Bible do you accept as the word of God? So we may deal with it. Now for our information, I might tell you, look, these are all different Bibles. You won't know. You never heard of anything like that before. This particular one here, the short and stumpy size, don't worry about the size. This one here is the Holy Bible of the Roman Catholics. They call it the Douay or Reims version of the Bible. This Bible has got 73 books inside. We might say chapters, they call it books. 73 books to make this one Holy Bible. And they say that between cover to cover, this is the Word of God. From cover to cover, inside all the contents, is God's Word. This is the Roman Catholic version. This black one here is also the Holy Bible. This is the authorized King James Version, the Bible of the Protestant world. All those who are not Roman Catholics are called Protestants. They protested away from the Roman Catholic Church. Protestants. And this is the Protestant Bible. They call it the King James Version or the Authorized Version. Authorized by who? Not God Almighty, but by King James. This is authorized not by God, by King James. Now in this Bible, there are only 66 books. 
The Roman Catholics have 73, this one has 66. Now you see, that's a version. This is not the difference in translation. A choice of words. You use one word here and a little variant word there. No, no, no. It's got nothing to do with words. These are seven books in here that the Protestants took it out and threw it away. The Protestant world, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Pentecostals, each and every one of them, they reject the seven books that are in here, seven extra books, more than this, as not the word of God. So when we say, okay, okay, we agree with you Protestants, that those seven extra books in the Roman Catholic Bible are not from God. Now we are being attacked that we are saying that this is not the word of God. I say, you tell us that in this book there are seven books which are not authoritative. They call them apocryphal. Apocrypha. What is apocrypha? Ask him. He say it is doubtful. So when it is doubtful, they threw it out. This has got six less books than that one there. So which one is the word of God? This one or that one? Then I have here two Bibles. And they look identical. Look the covering and all. They look like twins. Don't they? One is used a little more than the other. But there are twins. Coloring, same printers, same publishers, same title. Both say the Holy Bible, Revised Standard Version. The Holy Bible, Revised Standard Version. So what is there to choose between them? You say same. I says no, they're not the same. <laughs> Again, not the same. Although they are deceiving the people. Look, this is deception. If you had this, and if I had this as well, you think it's the same Bible. It's not the same Bible. Coming from the same printers, same price. But there is a difference. What is the difference? This is the Revised Standard Version. This was the authorized King James Version, accepted by the bulk of Christendom. Every translation in the vernacular, meaning in the native language of any nation, whether it is in Arabic, Urdu, Gujarati, Zulu, any language, if there is a translation, it is based on this one, the King James Version. Only in English you can get the Revised Version and the Revised Standard Version. Not in the other languages. They only give you this one here. Now this one is a Revised Version, so they will tell you what is the difference. The difference between this Bible and the King James Version, this one also has 66 books. That one has got 66 books. But these will tell you, the publishers of this will tell you, the 32 scholars of the highest eminent, eminence in Christendom, 32, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they went and produced this Bible. Christians, not Jews, not Muslims, or Hindus, Christians. Scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, with their support, they published the Revised Standard Version. What do they claim? They claim that this one here, goes to the most ancient manuscripts. This one and the Roman Catholic version goes to the ancient manuscripts. They had manuscripts some four to six hundred years after Jesus. They call them ancient. This one here now, they have access to other older manuscripts going back to the most ancient, that is two to three hundred years after Jesus. So the one closer to Jesus naturally will be more authentic than the one coming later on. It's common sense. If we had something given to us from the time of Jesus, in his lifetime, it will still be more authentic. If Jesus Christ had autographed, put his signature onto the volume, it would still be more authentic. So this one goes to the most ancient. The other one goes to ancient, this goes to the most ancient. So when they get the most ancient manuscripts, they find that there are so many things in the accepted versions which are not there. What is in the ancient manuscript is not in the most ancient. So as such, they were honor bound to eliminate them, to eliminate those. 
later editions. Because as the days goes on, mankind has a tendency to add, to add his own explanations, his own ideas. So they said, we must take out what is not supposed to be there. But before they do that, in the preface, they have something beautiful to say about this, the King James Version. They say that the King James Version has with good reason been termed the noblest monument of English prose. As far as language goes, in the English language, there is nothing comparable to it. The authorized King James Version of the Bible, as far as the language goes. It revises in 1881, express admiration for its simplicity, its dignity, its power, its happy tones of expression, the music of its cadences, and the felicities of its rhythm. It entered, as no other book has, into the making of the personal character and the public institutions of the English-speaking people. We owe to it an incalculable debt. This book, what it did to the English-speaking people, the Americans, the British, or anybody who speaks English, what it has done for them, the language is so beautiful, simple, powerful, musical, everything is in that book. That is the tribute they pay to that book, these revisers, to that old book, one of the most beautiful pieces of English literature, the authorized King James Version of the Bible. But now prepare for the shock. I'm sure you won't be shocked, but if they were Christians, they would be shocked. I said, prepare for the shock. What your people has gonna, are now going to tell you about the one you're carrying under your arm. They say, yet, the King James Version has grave defects. That one there has got grave defects. I'm not saying that. These are the learned men of Christianity, Christendom. They say, yet, the King James Version has grave defects. By the middle of the 19th century, the development of biblical studies and the discovery of many manuscripts more ancient than those upon which the King James Version was based made it manifest that these defects are so many and so serious as to call for revision. The defects in here are so many and so serious. This is no plaything. This is no joke, they are saying. So serious and so great that it calls for revision. So they revised it. So between the two, which one will you have? You have to make a choice. This one, the Christian scholar says, got grave defects. And there are so many and so serious. What do you do with a thing like that, a book like that? How can it be a book of God if it has got grave defects and there are so many and so serious that they have to revise it? God's word. How can it be God's word? So, we will have to now accept this as the word of God. According to the Christian theologians, that not that, this one and that one have a common source, out. This one is the closest to what the true word of God ought to be. Says, okay, if that is what you say, let us see. We will examine it. This is what is given to us now. The Revised Standard Version. It was done in 1948. So we open this book, and we find that some of the most important things in Christendom are not there. They are thrown out. Like, for example, that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, he was taken up into heaven. This is found in those Bibles there, Luke chapter 24, verse 51. It says, and Jesus was raised up into heaven. They took it out, that this was not in the most ancient manuscripts. This was a fabrication, an interpolation. They took it out and they threw it out from here. They put it in a footnote, and footnote is not the word of God. Footnote is what the authors write is right. They took it out from the main text and they put it in a footnote that, look, this is what some people say, but this is not in the original, most ancient manuscripts. The ascension of Jesus is thrown out as a fabrication in this book. Who did it? Jewish scholars? No. Hindu scholars? No. Muslim scholars? No. Who did it? Christian scholars of the highest eminence, they did the job. And they say, this is a fabrication. Then in Mark chapter 16, 
verses 9 to 20, all thrown out as a fabrication. In this book, you'll find it in the footnote. It's not in the main text, meaning it is not the word of God. Who says so? Christian scholars. This is what they're telling us. Now, if you accept this as the word of God, then we say, look, you preaching about Jesus being taken up into heaven, two places, clear cut in Mark chapter 16, verses 19, and Luke chapter 24, verse 51, both the places is thrown out as fabrications. So we said, look, we'll accept this book, but there's no ascension. But how can you preach? How can the Christians preach without ascension? This is the kingpin of Christianity. Jesus Christ going up into heaven. But funny thing, all the writers of the Gospels, the Gospel of St. Matthew, Gospel of St. Mark, that of St. Luke, that of St. John, everyone says, he quotes, and Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, Matthew. Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, Mark, he says that. Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, says Luke. Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, says John. Each and everyone saw and recorded, the Holy Ghost told them to come and write it down, that my Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem, with every Tom, Dick and Harry was doing, 2,000 years ago. How did you ride into Jerusalem? On donkeys. They didn't use camels and they didn't use horses. What did they use? Donkeys. But now that is recorded. But going up into heaven is not there. It's funny. The Holy Ghost. Can you imagine the Holy Ghost not inspiring the people to write about the Son of God going up into heaven? But this is, doesn't fail. Make a note. Don't forget. My, my son rode the donkey into Jerusalem. My son rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Everyone makes a note. This Jesus Christ rode the donkey into Jerusalem, but nothing about going up into heaven. That is what they wrote. Then the verse on the Trinity. First epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. Where in this Bible it reads, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This was also thrown out. It's also thrown out from here. It's not there. This was also another interpolation, another adulteration. So they threw it out as a fabrication. Trinity is not here also. By the way, somebody questioned me about Trinity last night. I had something to say, by the way. There is a tape, videotape available by Khalid al-Mansur. He, uh, he has delivered lectures on the rise and demise of Christianity. They are available at the back. It deals with that subject of the Trinity. More, more comprehensive with that what I'm going to talk to you now. So this verse in the Trinity is also thrown out. Is it because the Quran says Wala taqulu salasa in response to that? No. They discovered that this verse that they are quoting now, the Christian missionaries are quoting, the clearest expression on the Trinity is that verse, if there is such a thing. But this was not supposed to be there. This was supposed to be a marginal note written by a certain vigilance of Thapsus in the 6th century. This man, he had these manuscripts and he made a note on the side for his own remembrance or his children's edification. He wrote the marginal note for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. That's his own marginal note. Nothing to do with the main text. Nothing to do with the manuscript. Like we do in the books, we make our own notes. We make our own marginal notes. So this vigilance of Thapsus, he did such a job. But when they were reproducing this in the printed form, these manuscripts, the marginal note crept into the main text. They thought, well, this is also part of it. And so they put it in. Now they realize that this is something extraneous. This is an interpolation. Take it out. So they took it out. That is the revised standard version of the Bible. But, you say, what about this? This twin, twin brother of his. I says, now, you see what the Christians had, had done? They let the cat out of the bag. That this is the truth of the matter. These are all interpolations. Man-made, these are all man-made things. And they made a net profit on that, on that version. They made a net profit of 15 million dollars. Before the missionaries woke up. 
So what's going on, man? You know, and then the guys, this is a new book, it's a revised version, goes to the most ancient manuscript, people are buying, buying, and they made a profit of $15 million. After making that profit, when the Christian missionaries, they woke up, he said, the ascension is taken away, is thrown out, the Trinity is thrown out, the begotten son is thrown out. Amazing. Everything what Islam says, they're coming to it. They're coming to it. They're coming to it. Whatever Islam was saying, whatever the Quran said, they are coming to it. They're coming closer. We should be congratulating them. So congratulations. Trinity is thrown out. This, whatever, all the other things, so many things are thrown out. Congratulations. Begotten son is thrown out. So, what they did was, they tell you here, 1971, they reproduced it. Therefore, this looks brighter than the other one. They reproduced the same book. But whatever they had taken out, they put it back. Why did they put it back? Maybe the Holy Ghost came and told them that. No, 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 no. No, no Holy Ghost came to them. No Holy Ghost. We must find out from them, what do they say? They didn't say Holy Ghost came and told them. No Holy Ghost came to them. They tell you here in the preface, they say, the second edition of the translation of the New Testament 1971, this one here. The second edition of the translation of the New Testament, 1971, profits from textual and linguistic studies published since the Revised Standard Version, New Testament, was first published in 1946. From that one to here, they had access to some more manuscripts. Further knowledge. Many proposals were for modification were submitted to the committee. Many proposals were submitted to the committee for in, by individuals, individuals, and two church denominations. They said, look man, this is no good. People are protesting. Ascension taken away from the book of God? It's no good. We will tell our people not to buy this book of yours anymore. So, Trinity taken out. We will tell our people not to buy the Bible anymore. And business is business. The customer is always right. Who said this? Not the Holy Ghost. No Holy Ghost came to them. It says here, individuals and two church denominations, they made a big hue and cry. They made a big noise. So, they tell you what they did. All of these were given careful attention by the committee. They were given careful attention by the committee. Two passages, the longer ending of Mark 16, 9 to 20, the ascension. And Luke Chapter 24, verse 51, are restored to the text. They put back again. Who did it? God did it? Is this his word? No, this is mankind. This is what they're doing all the time. The game that they're playing is a continuous game. Every minute they're changing by the minute. You can't imagine. You can't keep pace. As soon as you make a point. I made a point some years ago that in this Schofield Bible translation by Reverend Schofield, D.D., Doctor of Divinity, backed by nine other D.D.'s. They are telling us in the first verse of the book of the Bible, Genesis, first book, first book of the Bible, chapter 1, verse 1, it says there, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And they give a commentary, these scholars. And in that, they use the word, Allah for God, Elohim for God, and Allah, A-L-A-H, I was speaking last, last night, A-L-A-H, Allah for God. So I said, very good, very good, now you are coming closer, that the name of God Almighty is Allah. It's spelled out A-L-A-H. We spell it as A-L-L-A-H. I said, no man, how do you spell, but you must pronounce the way we are asking you to pronounce our language. It is not Allah, it's Allah. Try, try, try. Allah, not Allah. So, next one that comes out, Schofield Reference Bible, by <laughs> Schofield DD, backed by nine DDs, the word Allah is taken out. 
Now, how, how, how can you keep pace with them? By the minute, by the God, you, I just, you make a statement, they, they run to the press, they say, no, 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 this Muslim follows, you know, they're going to take advantage of this, take it out, out it goes. And they call it the word of God. If it was word of God, how can you play fast and loose with his word? But in the hearts of heart, they know this is not the word of God, therefore, they take all these advantages. To find out whether there is the word of God, there is not a single statement. Leave out statement. You see this word Bible. This word Bible is not in the Bible. They say from cover to cover. They're not talking about the cover. Between the covers, everything inside is the word of God. I said, okay, this word Bible, where did you get the word Bible from? Is it in the Bible? Believe me, the word Bible is not in the Bible. No, the word Bible is not in any version of the Bible. You'll never find the Bible inside the Bible. Where did you get it? See, they got this from the Greek word Biblos. Biblos means book. So, make it sound beautiful. It's a Bible. And write it the Holy, the Holy Bible. But the Holy Bible inside doesn't say this is the Holy Bible. The word Bible is not in the Bible. And yet you say the Bible is God's word. Where did you get the word Bible from? Whereas the word Quran is in the Quran. Of well Quran al Majid. Of but the Quran full of wisdom. No. The word Quran is in the Quran. Word Bible is not in the Bible. But they say the whole of it is, this is alright, let's analyze it. Is there any way in the Bible where God says, This is my book? Whereas Allah Bari Ta'ala says, Ar-Rahman allam al-Qur'an. By Ar-Rahman, he is the one who taught the Qur'an. Allah speaks that this is his book. Tanzeel al-Kitabi min Allah al-Aziz al-Hakim. That this is the revelation of the book, the Qur'an, from Al-Aziz, the exalted and powerful of wisdom from Allah Bari Ta'ala. This is his book. The Qur'an says again and again, this is his book, this is his book. The Bible, nowhere in this vast volume of 60, 73 books or 63, 66 of the Protestants, does it ever occur, the sentence of the verse, this is the book of God. Nowhere. Welcome. Welcome. Nowhere does the Bible call itself the Bible within the covers. Nowhere. And nowhere does it ever say, this is my book. God saying, this is my book. Where is the Quran mentioned? The name of the book is Al-Quran. And this is my book. This is my book. The book of God. This book doesn't say that. And in fact, the first five books of the Bible, called Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are attributed to the Holy Prophet Moses. In those five books, you will read there 700 times. 700 times the expression. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, and Moses spoke unto the Lord. The Lord spoke unto Moses, and Moses spoke unto the Lord. Which is a clear-cut statement that the Lord didn't speak it, and Moses didn't speak it. Somebody else is talking. If God wrote those words, if he spoke, he would say, I said unto Moses, and Moses said unto me, I spoke to Moses, and Moses spoke to me. No, a third person is writing, the Lord spoken to Moses, and Moses spoken to the Lord. 700 times they are telling you that God didn't write it, and Moses didn't write it. Then in the last book, supposed to be the book of Moses, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, we read, and there Moses died is Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, he's supposed to be writing it. It is supposed to be his book. But he's saying, and there Moses died. He died in the past tense, in the land of Beth Pier, over against Beth Pier. And no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day. Up to today, nobody knows where he is buried. But he's not dead yet. He's writing this and he says, nobody knows about his grave where he is up to today. How can anybody 
you know, write his own obituary, the prophets of God, writing beforehand that I died and up to today nobody knows my grave. How can anybody know his grave when the man is still alive and writing? No, he didn't write it. What it shows is that he didn't write it. And it continues. And Moses was. And I hope you will understand the simple English. Was, meaning the past tense. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. You understand English? Past tense, was, not is, was. And he died. He was 120 years old when he died. But the man is still alive. And he says, when he died, he died. But he's alive. He's writing it. How can he write that? And his natural powers had not abated. Meaning he was still young, virile. He can marry another 16 year old. He's 120 years old, but his natural powers had not abated. Did Moses boast like that? That me, you know, I'm 120 years old, I died. <laughs> I'm good enough. <laughs> Did he say that? These are not his words. So the book is telling you the internal evidence that Moses didn't write the book. Really, he didn't write the book and God didn't dictate the book. Now, the Christians, they believe that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, inspired the 40 authors of the Bible. But I would like to carry out a little experiment. And for that, I need somebody who can read the English Bible. We just want to compare, I just want to compare these two Revised Standard Version of the Bible, whether they are identical. I would like somebody to volunteer, please, to come along and just open up. I say Isaiah chapter 37. Open it, and I read it from this one, Isaiah 37, and we want to see how close they are, whether they are faithful to one another. I'm looking for a volunteer. Somebody just to see what I'm reading, whether it's correct. Master, it will be a great privilege and a pleasure for everybody if you will just, uh, I, I hope I'm not embarrassing you, please, you know, <laughs> please, please, I know you can, please, as a favor, please, please open Isaiah chapter 37. Isaiah 37. Isaiah 37. Yes. I'm reading from my Bible, and the brother will confirm whether they are both identical. I hope they are. When King, verse 1, when King Hezekiah heard it, he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth, sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. Is that yes. yes, yes. And, and he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shabna the secretary, and the senior priest, covered with sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos. Verse 3, they said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this day is the day of distress, of rebuke, and of disgrace. Children have come to the birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. And we jump to verse 8. Uh, the rabbi, rabbi Shake, returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, for he heard that the king had left Lush is hard words in the Hebrew language. And we carry on. Verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord and so on. Identical. Yes? Yes. But sir, this is Isaiah chapter 37. Yes? But this is 2 Kings. I'm reading from 2 Kings 18. Yes? 
In other words, not, this is word for word. These are written by two different authors, centuries after one another, and they are saying the word for word the same thing. What is written in Isaiah 2 Kings 19 is repeated word for word in the book of Isaiah, verse for verse. So it is in books of history. Right. But now the books of history, thank you sir. The books of history are not from God. You see what has happened? Please, please. You see, the Christians do not believe in a verbal inspiration. As we Muslims believe. We Muslims believe that the Holy Quran was inspired verbally. Meaning that God Almighty sends his messenger, the Archangel Gabriel, and commands the Holy Prophet Muhammad, saying, Qul Allahu Ahad, say he is Allah the one and only, Allahu Samad, God the Eternal Absolute, Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad, he does not he does not beget and is not begotten, Walam Yakun Lahu Kufu and Ahad, and there's nothing like unto him. Close the chapter. Chapter closed. These words were put into the mouth of Muhammad. And as they were put into his mouth, he uttered them. That is what we Muslims believe about the Quran. The Christians do not believe in a verbal inspiration of the Bible. That they were inspired, they were moved, they were tickled to write what they wrote. They are not, it's not being dictated to them. Says, Come on, sit down. To a group of secretaries, I dictate a, a statement, and everybody is making a note word for word. Whatever I say, they take it down, and then they go and send it to the newspapers. That is dictation, verbal dictation. But if somebody is inspired to write about this meeting, no two journalists can reproduce word for word the same thing, unless they are copying from one another, unless they are plagiarizing. You wrote a statement, a big article, and somebody word for word reproduced in another newspaper, you as a journalist, you have, to, you have a right to charge that person for plagiarism, stealing in literature, because that man has stolen your work. So, the author of two kings and the author of Isaiah 37 are two different persons. Supposed to be. But inspired by the same Holy Ghost. Now they could not write word for word the same statement. At the same place, one to verse one, verse one, verse three, verse three, verse four, verse four, and verse by verse, 38, 38. Every verse, verse for verse, no two human beings can ever reproduce the same thing unless it's being dictated to. And the Christians do not believe in a verbal inspiration. In other words, somebody was plagiarizing or unless the Holy Ghost lost his memory and he dictated to one and centuries later he dictated the word for word the same instead of saying, hey, go and look up that other book. He wasted his time repeating again word for word, comma for comma, full stop for full stop, semicolon for semicolon. This is not the book of God. This is what we are saying, God doesn't do a job like that. Now when we take the books as they are, the books of the New Testament, each and every book begins at the heading, the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the Gospel according to St. Mark, the Gospel according to St. Luke, the Gospel according to St. John. Now what is this according, according, according? Why according to? You know why? Because Matthew didn't sign his name, Mark didn't sign his name, Luke didn't sign his name, John didn't sign his name to those manuscripts. These are supposed to be. Therefore we say according to, you have this booklet given to you. Is the Bible God's word? Each and every person is supposed to have received it. You have? Yes. If you look at it, it says Ahmad Didat. Or you'll find other books saying by Ahmad Didat. It's not according to Ahmad Didat. According to, you can write anything. He says, you know, Mr. Didat said this, that, that, and then you create your own imagination and you fill in. And he says, according to Mr. Didat, such and I said, no, I didn't say that. I didn't mean that. This is what you can hold me responsible for. This is my book. But according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John, that means Matthew didn't write it, Mark didn't write it, Luke didn't write it, and John didn't write it. This is what people say, this is what people think. And J.B. Phillips, J.B. Phillips, he wrote the Gospels in Modern English. You see, these English that they are using is archaic, old-fashioned. And the modern young men, they find it difficult to grasp. So J.B. Phillips, 
a prebendary of the Chichester Cathedral in England, meaning a paid servant of the Anglican Church. He wanted to do a good job helping the younger generation. He knows Greek, so he goes firsthand to the Greek manuscripts and he rewrites the Gospels in modern English, English that the ordinary young men will understand. But in his introduction to the Gospel of St. Matthew, he says about the Gospel of Matthew, this is what he says. A paid servant of the church. He is no enemy, he is no Jew, he is no, he is no Hindu, he is not a Muslim. As a paid servant of the church, these are his statements. He says, early tradition ascribed this gospel to the Apostle Matthew. That's what people said, that this is the gospel of Matthew. But scholars nowadays almost all reject this view that Matthew wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Scholars, which scholars? Christian scholars, almost all, not Hindu scholars, or Jewish scholars, or Muslim scholars, Christian scholars, almost all reject the view that Matthew wrote this book. He says the author, the author, whom we may still conveniently call Matthew, what else can we do? What else can we do? If I were to give you a reference, it's a Matthew 9.9, I want to give you a reference, Matthew 9, 9. But he says, you see, the first book of the New Testament, chapter 9, verse 9. The first book of the New Testament, chapter 5, verse 17. The Why do I do have to lay belabor that? I said, Matthew 9, 9. Or Mark 3, 16. Or John 3, 16. Whatever. I use this because there is no better way than to have a quick reference. I use the name. Conveniently. Conveniently, you still call him Matthew. The author, whom we may still conveniently call Matthew, has plainly drawn on the mysterious Q. Mysterious Q. What is that? It's short for the German word Quella. means sources, some mysterious sources. He has used, Matthew, has used Mark's gospel freely. J.B. Phillips says. He has used Mark's gospel freely. In the language of the school teacher, he has been copying wholesale from Mark. 85% of Mark is copied at verbatim, word for word, by Matthew and Luke. And this is not done in the book of God. God doesn't do that. You go along and sit with somebody else's manuscript, and you copy 85%, and you give credit to the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost didn't do that. You had the books with mysterious Q. Some hidden sources, which they have not have found yet, but they can see from the copying, if you take this chunk out, word for word, and you add some more, you addition. You, the other guy also does the same, word for word, he copies it, and he changes a little here and there. You know that they have a common source. That common source is not the Holy Ghost, because those words were not given by the Holy Ghost. They had a mysterious document called the Q, from which they were all copying. And Matthew 9.9, 9, he tells us, in the clearest words, manner possible, that Matthew didn't write it. Matthew 9.9, 9. I have to say Matthew 9.9. 9. Chapter, Matthew chapter 9 verse 9. He says, while he, that is Jesus, while he was going forth into the way, he, Jesus, saw a tax collector called Matthew. He, Jesus, came up to him, Matthew, and said unto him, Matthew, follow me, Jesus, and he, Matthew, followed him, Jesus. Did Matthew write that? Could Matthew have written a thing like that? If Matthew wrote it, he would have said, while he, Jesus, was going forth into the way, he saw me at the tax collector's table, and he came up to me and said, follow him, and I followed him. But if somebody else is talking, an eyewitness or a ear witness, or somebody writing from hearsay, these are not even the words of Matthew. Now let us get it from the horse's mouth. The gospel writers themselves. We find in the gospel of Saint Luke, Saint Luke tells us in the clearest language humanly possible how he got this thing written down. He says, Luke says, in as much, chapter 1 of Luke, verse 1, in as much as many have taken in hand 
to set in order a narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us, verse 2, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. No Holy Ghost, no Holy Spirit coming to him. He said, I've seen others doing it. And Luke being a physician, he is one of the most learned of the writers of the New Testament books. He says that if every Tom, Dick and Harry, man, this semi-educated fellows, if they can write an account of my Lord Jesus, why can't I do a better job? So I will make an orderly account. He's telling you what he's going to do. I'm going to put it in order. The others are not in order. It's here, there, everywhere, hosh potch. He said, no, no, no. I, because of my education, I'm able to do an orderly account to educate his most excellent Theophilus. He's dedicating to a, 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 a new convert, a Greek. God doesn't do that. Dedicating his work to a Greek new convert. But this is what Luke tells us, that this is how he got it. He saw others doing it like people get inspired. We all get inspired. How? Something inspires you. see a boxing match, and you say, from now on, I'll become a boxer. You are inspired. But that's not from the Holy Ghost. There was a time when I was getting inspired. I also wanted to become the heavyweight champion of the world. Around the 30s, see? Joe Louis was the champion boxer, heavyweight champion of the world. And I get the ring magazine from America, regularly. Boxing magazine. And I see his statistics. Joe Louis, the brown bomber. So, I take his statistics and I put myself against the wall. And I mark it out. Reach, reach. 72 inches. Joe Louis, 72 inches. Ahmad Didar, 72 inches. Height. Well, I think I was about half an inch or quarter inch shorter than him. Biceps. No comparison. But I said, I'll do plenty of exercise and I'll fill it up. Hmm? Height. Okay. Weight. That guy is 200 pounds. I'm only 148. I said, mm, I'm going to eat plenty of butter and do plenty of exercise and I'll also... This is inspiration. I'm inspired to become a heavyweight champion of the world. But I know, you know, thank God, I changed the route. I did something else. Then, going to the cinemas, I see a film. Ginger Rogers and Fred Astor, the tap dancers. I says, man, that's great. You know, cut, 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 you know, this is beautiful. I says, man, look at it, how easy they're doing it. And they're moving and they're flying. Right, I must do the same. So I see a comic in which there's a course is offered, tap dancing. So I write, I send my money to America, thank God that the course didn't come. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here before you. <laughs> inspired. You see, inspired. We all get inspired. But this is not of the Holy Ghost. See, the Holy Ghost doesn't inspire these things. See, that type of inspiration, Luke was, Mark, Matthew, they were inspired, yes. But not from God. This inspiration, we all get it at all times. But they are not infallible. Now, if we analyze the internal evidence about the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 3, verse 23, it says, Now, Jesus himself began to be about, I'm reading, about 30 years of age when he began to preach. God is inspiring, supposed to be. It's from the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost didn't know how old Jesus was. God didn't know how old his Jesus was. He said, about 30 years old. You can guess about my age. You have a right. I have a right to guess your age. But I will say, this gentleman here is about 55 years old. I say, you are about 45. And you are about 60. About, about, because I'm human. But if God was telling me, he would tell me, this guy is 55. I have to say he's 55. That guy's 40. That guy's 30. I don't say about, about, about. I know that this is human. The human being, he can't take a chance. He can't afford to make a mistake. So he covers himself up by saying, about 30 years old. Not God. This is not the word of God. If it is the word of God, God will say he was 30 years old, my son, when he began to preach. But again, another shocking thing. He started to preach at the age of 30. 
God Almighty, they say, Jesus is God, like last night you heard, Jesus is God. This God Almighty, after millions of years in hibernation, I don't know what he was doing with Father, Son and Holy Ghost as the Christians, they were all three together. What they were discussing and what they were planning, God alone knows. And he comes into the world and from birth to the age of 30, he didn't say one word that could benefit mankind, not one word. Can you imagine? Up to the age of 30, he didn't utter a single word that's recorded anywhere in any Christian literature. One word to help mankind. What was he doing? Playing marbles, doing carpentry, God Almighty, nothing else to do, nothing better to do. The mankind is going astray, his people are going to the dogs, the Jews. He calls them hypocrites, you generation of wipers, you whited sepulchres. Not all of a sudden, they were there all the time. From his childhood, from his birth up to the age of 30, he saw the problems all around him, but he didn't utter one word. So, he says, when he began to preach, he was about 30 years old. Now, when he began to preach, in the modern translations of the same book, they took the words, when he began to preach, is taken out. Because now people will ask question, what was he doing for 30 years? God coming down to earth and for 30, de- 30 years he does nothing? Ahmad did ask the great lecturer. He comes to Copenhagen and he stays here for 30 years and he doesn't make a single statement. Can you, can you imagine? Huh? A man, <laughs> I'm coming here for 30 years in Stockholm or here and I stay with you people for 30 years and didn't make a sound. And I'm supposed to be, Jesus was supposed to be God Almighty coming down to earth. And for 30 years, he didn't do one stitch of work for God, according to the records. It's recorded nothing. Who being the son of Joseph? That's what Luke says. Jesus is the son of Joseph. Joseph the carpenter is his father. That's what the book says. But you have the words written in brackets, as was supposed. Luke didn't write them. You ask any Christian who's got any knowledge of theology, that the words in brackets in the Bible are the words of the translators. The editors. They try to help you. That maybe you might not grasp the full meaning. So they put the words in brackets. As was supposed are put in brackets. In the English Bible, in the Revised Version, the words as was supposed are in brackets. Meaning, they are not the words of Luke. Luke didn't write them. If Luke wrote them, that means they will be without brackets. But that is the word of God, because God was supposed to have inspired him. But no, they know that Luke didn't write them, so they put the words in brackets. That's the system. We also adopt the same system. We want to explain something, we put the words in brackets, our own words. Our translators do the same. Nothing wrong with that. But now you take the Swedish Bible, you take the Danish Bible, the words as were supposed are there, but the brackets are removed. You know what it means? Once you remove the brackets, they become the words of Luke. And if Luke was inspired, they become the words of God. So they are minting God's word by the minute. You don't have to wait for the Holy Ghost, they can do it. The printers, you just tell them, put the words in, and then take the brackets out, with the brackets. They are honest. But then read in the words and remove the brackets. And this the Christians have done in every language of the world except English. Because the Englishmen understand what bracket means. Maybe the Danes don't know what brackets means. The Swedes don't know. The Urdu speaking people don't know. The Zulus don't know. The Africans don't know. They are all little children. The rest of mankind in 2,000 different languages of the world they have translated the Bible. But in 2,000 different languages you'll find the words there but the brackets not there. Because all fools, they don't know what brackets mean. But the Englishman knows. So he retains the brackets. Can you imagine the game that is being played? So they are minting God's word by the minute. One stage, you are honest, you say it's not the word of God in brackets. Then you leave the words and you remove the brackets, minting them as God's words. George Bernard Shaw, one of the great British playwrights, he says that the Bible, he says, that the Bible is the most dangerous book on earth. 
It says, keep it under lock and key. Your children must not have access to it. George Bernard Shaw. And the Plain Truth magazine, a Christian magazine originating in America, the Plain Truth, they say reading Bible stories to children can also open up all sorts of opportunities to discuss the morality of sex. An unexpurgated Bible might get an X rating from some senses. Cross. Not fit for your children. Now, it is not my duty to give that to you, but I'll give you just one verse. One verse. There's so much there. I have given some of these in my book. Is the Bible God's Word? And there I have suggested to my readers that you obtain a Bible. Get a Bible. Obtain a Bible. The Christians are ready to give you one free. Get it from them. They'll be very happy. Can we have a Bible, sir? In Danish? Yes. In English, get it from them. And then I'm telling you here in this book, code mark your Bible, code mark. Certain things that you can positively prove, like is the Bible, what the Bible says about Muhammad, the verses. Mark it in green, green crayon. What you do? Your children's crayon. You know crayon for coloring that your children use? If not, buy a packet of crayons, different, different color. Green for positive. Whatever you want to use, that God says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I'll put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, find it and mark it in green, green crayon. Then I will tell you that these are contradictory. This one contradicts that, that one contradicts this. What you do, get a yellow crayon and mark all the contradictions. And mark it, this one contradicts that, that one contradicts this. Color coding. Then there are verses there, too shameful. Too shameful for me to read it to you, to utter it to you. I challenge Jimmy Swaggart. You know, if you get the tape you see there, I challenge him to read Ezekiel chapter 23. But when I challenge him, I opened the book and gave him the modern translation, where they call a spade a spade. I gave it to him, open book, I said, read this and I give you $100. So if you watch the tape, you notice that he took the Bible, he scanned it, and he put it upside down on the table. Then he took his own Bible and he read. So I took out the hundred dollars and I gave it to him. Next morning, some Arab students who are studying there in Baton Rouge, where this debate took place, they said, Uncle, what was the joke? He says, you know, you said something, and the guy read it, and you had to give him hundred dollars, you lost. He said, yes, I lost. What was the joke? They couldn't catch it. I said, you see, the joke was my son. You have certain difficulties. You Arabs, you have special difficulties. You come from Saudi Arabia or from any Arab country. Before you leave the country, you learn grammar, you learn vocabulary to fit yourself into the university so you can get the knowledge, become a technician, an engineer, whatever, and you go back home. But colloquial English, very difficult. The Englishman, the American, he's talking and he's joking and he's laughing and you don't know what the joke is about because you haven't got the mastery over the language. Number one, your problem, you do not understand English too well. Number two, Swagart was reading archaic English, old-fashioned. See, this I gave him a modern translation where they call a spade a spade. He was not reading that, he's reading something archaic, old-fashioned. Not modern English, old-fashioned. And he was reading 60 miles an hour. So he's reading, son of man, there were two women, daughters of one mother, and they committed whoredoms in Egypt, they committed whoredoms in the youth. And the Arab said, whoredom, what is whoredom? Whoredom. He's thinking, whoredom. And he's gone 10 miles beyond, he's gone. He says, before you can catch up, he's gone. What is whoredom? What does the poor Arab know? Whoredom. Huh? What does he know? Whoredom. So he's thinking, whoredom. What, what is that? What did he say? Huh? 10 miles gone. So the guy's reading 100 miles an hour. Shh. And I said, to you people, pornography is no pornography. 24 hours a day, you see it on TV. So it doesn't shock you anymore. Suppose you understood it too, it won't shock you. You see the, the words, you know, the language that they're using, filthy, dirty language, every other word is a swear word. So to you, pornography is no pornography. This was the thing. But 
I challenge, I said, no decent man, no decent Christian can read it to his mother, his sister, his daughter, or even to his fiancée if she is a good woman. But so I got read it. And now we found out that he was not a good man. You found out that he was not a decent man. He proved again and again that he's not a decent man. He read it. But I, I, I doubt if a sensible Christian can ever come and read it to his congregation. Ezekiel chapter 16, Ezekiel chapter 23, but this one little snippet I can leave with you, the Jewish James Bond in the Bible. You know James Bond? James Bond from Russia with love? The book of Judges in the Bible, chapter 16, verse 1, don't go far. Chapter 16, verse 1, then Samson. You know Samson, that hero, that great guy? You saw the film Samson and Delilah. But this is a, that Samson. Then Samson went to Gaza, where all the trouble is taking place. You know, this, in Madrid they are discussing Gaza and West Bank. He's talking about that Gaza. Then Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot. You know what's a harlot? A whore. You know what's a whore? A prostitute. Now you know, a hooker. You know what's a hooker? You don't know? Well, to talk to you people, <laughs> I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting my time with you all. <laughs> a harlot, a whore, a prostitute, a hooker, you don't know? Ask your neighbor, ask your neighbor. <laughs> he saw a harlot there and went in and to her. That's all. He went in and to her. He had sex with her. With a harlot, with a prostitute. He did zina. And Allah didn't punish him. Nothing, not one word of condemnation, nothing. So this is the teaching for you. So, man, this is like eating peanuts. You know, you see a harlot, a prostitute, a whore, a hooker, and you go in and he says, well, it's just like eating peanuts. Mm -hmm. Carry on. Nothing. What have you done? Nothing. Nothing serious. He says, look, this is not in the book of God. Because every type of stories we tell children, Dr. Vernon Jones, he carried out experiments on a group of school children to whom certain stories were being read. And he said that these stories, whatever stories you tell these children, they made certain slight but permanent changes in character, even in the narrow classroom situation. The type of stories that you tell creates the type of mentality that you have. If you tell them good stories about brave men, good men, heroes, they'll start behaving like that. You tell them all this filth and rot, you see in my country what I can buy here in Stockholm and take them to South Africa. I go to jail for two years. If I get it from your London, Heathrow, airport I can buy in the bookstores. I get, go to jail for two years. Kennedy Airport, if I buy the things that I can get there, you know, for my curiosity, and I take it home, two years jail. That country, land of apartheid, as far as morality is concerned, they are very strong. The injustice they did to us, that's at a different level. Racism, that's different. But morality, ethics, pornography, they hate it. Two years jail. So they know that the type of literature that your children will read, you will read, is going to contaminate your minds. That's all. But in the book of God, I'm calling. But you see there in the Bible, shh, rape, rape, incest, types and types of incest. I don't know whether you know how many types of incest there are. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, you start incest between father and daughter. Then, still in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, between son and mother. Then, still in the book of Genesis, still in the first book, you find father-in-law and daughter-in-law. What kind of book is this? Incest after incest. Types and types of incest. You don't know how many types of incest can take place, go to the Bible and you'll get them. All different types of incest. You don't have to write, read another book on sexology to find out the types of incest that you can commit. This is in the Holy Bible. References are there. Then this book describes God in a very, very shameful manner, blasphemous manner. This book, if it's a book of God, how can God utter these? How can God Almighty dictate these words? Listen. Book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 20. In the same day, the Lord will shave with a hired razor. Lord means God. He's going to shave with a hired razor. With those from beyond the river, with the king of Assyria, the head, the head and the hair of the legs, 
and the hair of the legs. And we'll also remove the beard. We'll shave your beard as well. Your legs, how far? Will the hairs be removed? God talking like that. God dictating that God is going to do that. He's going to shave with a higher razor. You know the cutthroat razors there. And he's going to shave your legs. Huh? He's going to, God is going to shave your legs and your head and your, and your beard. Does it defeat God? God are writing like this. These are his words. Astaghfirullah. And some more. Smoke went out from his nose. 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, chapter 22, verse 9 to 11. Smoke went from his nostrils. You know when you smoke and you, you take out smoke from your nostrils. Well, God is big. So all smoke must be coming out from his nostrils, you know, from his nose. And devouring fire from his mouth like the dragon. You see the Chinese dragon. And you see the fire like a flamethrower. They use it in, the, in World War I. Flamethrower. You know flamethrower? You see the flame going. So something came out from God's mouth. Listen, listen, I'm only reading. He says, and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. You know, coal, pile of coal lying. And the flame goes out and, shh, and set the coal on fire. He bowed the heaven also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a chiro. God Almighty, he rode upon a chiro. <laughs> and flew. You know what is a chiro? Chiro, chiro. They have it in the Vatican. I've been there to the Vatican. The holiest holy is in Christian time. And this is the picture taken in the Vatican. The holies of holies. This is the chiro. There are two cherubs there in marble, flesh color. Please don't take photos of this. Because in Arab countries, this tape will be banned. You can see it. This is actual photo taken from the holies of holies, the Vatican. There are two beautiful young ladies, young, crisp, well proportioned, flesh color, smooth as silk, absolutely naked, but with wings. There are two there, one facing the other. And if you ever put your hand over that marble, you will get an electric shock. You ask them, what is that? So that's a chirrup. That's a chirrup. Means a baby angel. Second grade. Angels. And God riding that. Astaghfirullah. Not riding a helicopter or a spitfire. He rides little chirrups. You know, girls, beautiful young girls. He rides them and he flies. Like this Superman. You see it in the film, Superman. You know how he flies? Now, how can this be the book of God? How can God utter such words for himself? Then the Quran gives us a test. How are we to know whether this book, the Quran, is from Allah or not? He says, Quran. Do they not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone other than Allah, لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافٌ كَسِيرًا you will have found in it many discrepancies, many contradictions, because no human being can ever remain consistent in what he's preaching all his life. We change by the minute. According to the circumstances, we change our standards, our principles. We are human. No human being can remain constant for 23 years of his prophetic life. No human being can. Unless he's guided by God. It's only God who's talking, he can be constant. No man can be. Different vicissitudes of life, problems of life, man changes, he makes compromises. This is the test which Allah wants you to apply to the Quran. If you are doubting that this is not, this is Allah's kalam, then apply the test. Go and check it up, see if you can find contradiction therein. And you will not find any contradiction. So the same test we apply to the Bible. The test Allah gives us to apply to the Quran, we apply to the Bible, whether it is Allah's kalam. And I'm reading now. From the book of Chronicles, 1st Chronicles chapter 21. It says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Shaitan, he instigated, not the Holy Ghost. Shaitan instigated Dawud to go and take a census of the Jews. That's what the book says. One author of the Bible. There are 40 different authors. One of them say, Shaitan is responsible for Dawud taking a census of the Jews. 
Another author, 2 Samuel chapter 24 says, And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David. Lord means God. God moved David. And he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. Who instigated David? One author says, Shaitan, the devil. And the other says, God. And God and Satan are not synonymous terms in any language. Shaitan is Shaitan and Lord is Lord. Who inspired David to do such a thing of numbering, taking a census? Who? God or the devil? They have to make a choice. 1 Samuel chapter 28 verse 6 says, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, means he wanted to know information from God, Lord means God, the Lord did not answer him. Allah didn't answer him. I, neither, either by dreams or by urim or by prophets. He didn't answer him. In the book of Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 10 verse 14, we, say, we are told, but he, Saul, did not inquire of the Lord. First one, the other one says, he inquired of the Lord and the Lord didn't answer. 1 Chronicles 10, 14 says, but he did not inquire of the Lord, therefore he killed him, therefore God killed him, because he didn't ask Allah. Now, we want to know, if brothers, if they want to have this, easier reference, you can give, return it to me at question time. You don't have to look up the Bible, I have got it already here, you know, anybody wants to have access to it, you may have access to this, you know, if, in case you want to respond at any time, make it easy, but if you like to have it. You like to, you may have that. You like to? One king, chapter 7. And it was an handbread thick, and the brim thereof was wrought like the brim of a cup with flowers of lilies. It contained 2,000 baths. It contained 2,000 baths. Very clear? 2,000 baths. 2 Chronicles, chapter 4, it says, and Three, same thing, 3,000 baths. Was it 2,000? The Holy Ghost is inspiring one author to say 2,000 baths he had. The other one he says it was 3,000 baths. The difference is only 50%. Take this thing. What was it? 2,000 or 3,000? 2 Chronicles. Chapter 9, verse 25. It says, and Solomon had 4,000 stalls of horses. You know, stable, stable for keeping horses. How many? 4,000. In the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 26, it said, and Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses. Was it 4 or 40? He said, oh, this difference of just a zero. I said, no, no, there's no zero. The Jews didn't know zero. They knew zero about zero when these books were written. They learned it from the Arabs, and the Arabs learned it from my forefathers, the Indians. Zero. Zero, they learned it from the Indians, the Arabs, and they passed it on to Europe. But the Jews didn't know zero. They wrote in words, 4,000, 40,000. They didn't know about zeros. Was it four or was it 40? Here is something very simple. Coming to the New Testament, John chapter 18, verse 9. Jesus says that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. Words of Jesus. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. He's talking about his disciples. God Almighty gave him his disciples. Twelve. He said, of, of those whom you gave me, you means God. O oh Allah, those that you gave me to be my Hawariyun, my disciples, I have lost none. You know what none means? Not one. You understand that? Not one. But just one chapter before, chapter 17 of John, verse 12, we read, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, except, none of them is lost. Means not one is lost, except the son of perdition, that is Judas Iscariot, except one. The difference between none and one, between zero and one. You know, I offered some people some reward. I had 50 pounds with me then. And I said, anybody can give me in percentage, in percentage, 
what is the percentage difference between zero and one. I'll give you these. And I started with the ladies. I said the ladies first preference. I know we have been depriving them of that benefit. The difference between zero and one, how many percent? I don't know what. Suleiman, have you got any money with you? <laughs> hundred Quran or whatever is Quran? <laughs> right, hundred. Right here. This is hundred krona, krona. One hundred krona. The difference between one and zero. How many percent? Between zero and one. My sisters first, before I give these, my brothers a chance. Wallah, it's yours. You can buy something for the children. The difference in percentage, you see, between one and two is 100 percent. Between one and three is 200 percent. Between zero and one, how many percent? Don't be afraid. Don't, this is like uh, talking to your uncle, your father, he wants to give you, you know, he's itching to share this with you. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Between zero and one. How many percent? Zero. Come on now, you. Huh? Who said infinity? This is yours. You can have it. Thank you. Too. Infinity. It is such a huge difference, it's unimaginable. Between nothing and one, this unimaginable, infinite. There's an infinite percentage. Remember that. One day you'll win some quiz. It's infinite. My dear brothers and sisters, it looks like I have barely started. I'm just getting warmed up. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's fair to you all. I would rather leave now this meeting open, open for you to ask questions on what I have spoken or any other matter relating to the subject of comparative religion. I give you that latitude to come forward and uh, you can ask your questions. Thank you very much, Sheikh Peter, for your very interesting way of presenting the topic, uh, whether the Bible is the word of God. I'm certain there must be an abundance of questions waiting to be put forward to you. And uh, now, as Sheikh Peter said, the scene is open for questions from the audience. You asked for questions, that is why I'm hesitating, because i rather have some responses. But let me try to find a question out of it. Yes. You know, I'm sure, that as highly as you place the Quran as the Word of God, we place Jesus as the Word of God, because the will of God can be expressed in a book, but the person of God can only be expressed in a person. That is why we say Jesus is the perfect Word of God. The Bible, we say, is a book made by man and God. And it does not change the picture it gives of God a little bit if there are 200 or 300 bat or whatever numbers you can find which are different. It is a book about history. It tells about people, real people, sinful people, and it condemns what is wrong. More and more clearly, and most clearly in Jesus, we hear how he condemns what is wrong. But it knows how people are, and describes how people are, as sinful as they are. But what the Bible teaches about God, we praise that as the Word of God, with the authority of God. And, no, I cannot make it into a question, but maybe you have a response anyway. <laughs> Uh, 
Mr. Chairman and brethren, our brother has said a hard task. It's really a hard task. He is not asking a question because whatever I said is unquestionable. You can't question it. When I said, look here, coming from the same source, Jesus, he lost one or none. Is this both words from God? He said, none means not one, and he said only one. Did he know that or not? The difference between one and none, which is infinite degree. Can this, the inspirer of that, could it be God? That's all we are asking. Could God be the inspirer of the word about 30 years old? Does God talk like that? Does he know or doesn't he know? My God is an all-knowing God. He knows everything about every, everybody. He doesn't have to guess. But this inspirer, if there was such a thing, he doesn't know how old Jesus was. He didn't know. It inspires Luke to write that he was the son of Joseph and he needed your help. This Holy Spirit needed your help to tell him, no, it was as was supposed. It can't be the word of God. That's what I was trying to say. With regard to Jesus being the word of God, the Quran testifies to that. It says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu. So behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna allaha yubashiruki bi kalimatim minhu. Allah gives you glad tidings of a word from him. The Quran testifies that Jesus is the word of God. Ismuhul Masih, his name will be the Messiah, translated Christ. Isa ibn Maryama, Jesus the son of Mary, Wajihan fi dunya wal akhirah, held in honor in this world and in the hereafter, wa min al muqarrabin, and of the company of those nearest to God. He is the word of God. But your understanding and our understanding is different. See, the Hindu, my ancestors, they say everything is the word of God. The Hindu, my ancestors and my cousins who are not converted. My forefathers were Hindus. I mean Indian. My forefathers were Hindus. They worship men and monkeys, elephants and snakes. That's my forefathers. And we worship each and everything, element, the rivers, the mountains, the trees, anything, everything, because my forefathers philosophized that everything is the word of God. So if everything is the word of God, is God. The word of God is God. We say no. The Muslim says no. You say yes, only one exception. Because God created everything by his word. Book of Corinthians. He says, by faith we know that the heavens and the earth were created by the word of God. And that the things visible came through the force invisible. Meaning the invisible will and plan and will of God brought everything to being. By God's word, he willed it. But you say, yes. But it's not God. Everything, God said, and God said, book of Genesis. Let there be light. And there was light. Meaning the sun. That's his word. He said light, or he said sun. Sun came. Stars, stars came. Trees, mountain, dog, pig, everything is his word. But that's not God. It is God's word. But it is not God. But you say yes. You agree with me. But exception that Jesus being the word of God is God. You make an exception. The Hindu makes no exception. The word of God is God. You say yes. The word of God is not God except one. That is Jesus. We Muslims say the word of God is not God. Not many, nor one. None. The word of God is his word. But is not him as I. My words are not me. I started here about five past or ten past six. And I'm talking and I can talk to you till midnight tonight. And I will not diminish in my size. I'll keep on talking and talking and talking. And I'm still the same did that. I'll get tired. But I'm the same did that. Because... My words are not me. If my words was me, then every word I speak, I start diminishing, getting less and less and less, till I dissipate, vanish away. Greater than all. You see, so God Almighty, He creates by His will, which we describe as His word. 
He is the word of God. And this is what the Quran testifies against. So, Qul, tell them, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, La taghlu fi dinikum. He says, do not go to extremes in your religion. Wala taqulu ala Allah illa al-haq. And don't say anything about God except the truth. Innama al-Masih, most certainly the Messiah, translated Christ. Innama al-Masih, who is Ibn Maryama, Jesus the son of Mary, Rasulullah, is a messenger of God. Wa kalimatuhu, and a word proceeding from him. Word, word, word again. Is a word proceeding from him. Al-Qaha ila Maryamu waruhum minhum, which he bestowed upon Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him. Fa'aminu billahi wa rusulihi, so believe in Allah, God Almighty, and his messenger, Jesus, believe in. That he is the word of God, but the word of God is not God. As such, we must love him, respect him, revere him, follow him, but don't worship him. That's all what we are saying. Love him, respect him, follow him. But you are not prepared to follow him. The Christians don't want to follow Jesus. Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, most certainly I'm telling you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no heaven for you unless you are better than the Jew. That's what it means. Words have any meaning, I don't know, in Danish if it means something else. Except your righteousness, your good deeds, ex exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven, there is no heaven for you. That's what he said. And I'm asking, how can you be better than the Jew by not keeping the laws and the commandments? You don't keep the laws and the commandments. You say the law is nailed to the cross. You say you are living under grace. I'm asking, are you circumcised? Well, no. Your Lord was circumcised. On the eighth day, when he was eight days old, he was circumcised. And named Jesus by the angel when he was in his mother's womb. Your Lord was circumcised and you are not. In which way are you following him? He said, he is not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. You're not following him. He never had the pig, you are all pig eaters. Am I right? The whole Christian them, they eat pigs. When the Lord Jesus didn't eat the pigs, none of his disciples ever touched that abominable flesh. And everyone is going the other way around. He was circumcised, you're not circumcised. He didn't eat the pig, you all eat pigs. Amazing situation. And you say, you follow him. In which way are you following him? He said, you are not of me if you don't take up your cross and you follow me. You don't belong to Jesus. We belong to him. See, because we follow him. Jesus said, not what gets into your mouth make you filthy, but what gets out of your mouth make you filthy. Brother, brother, please, don't, don't attribute anything to Jesus which Jesus didn't say. Jesus never uttered those words. Look, you got a Bible in your hand. These are the words of Peter. Peter said that. In the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, sir, in the book of Acts. To learn about Cornelius. Cornelius was the first Gentile to become a Christian. You like to find those words? Go ahead. You find them and you tell me that Jesus said not what goes in but what comes out that pollutes you. i like you to find those words. Right, next question if there's any. Are there any other questions? Assalamu alaikum. Could you kindly clarify the death of Jesus according to Quran and Hadith? Because in one, uh, at one place in Quran it says, إِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى إِنِّي مُتَوَفِّيكَ وَرَافِئُكَ إِلَيَّ and when Allah says, O oh Isa, I take the life from you, literally it means I take the life from you, وَرَافِئُكَ إِلَيَّ and take you upwards to me. And in another place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ and they did not kill him, and they did not crucify him. So the question is, who was crucified and what 
does the Holy Ghost, Ruh al Quddus, have to do with the birth of Jesus? Thank you. I don't think it was one question, quite a few in one, wrapped up. What does the Holy Ghost have to do with the birth of Jesus? Well, look, I don't know about the Holy Ghost. But I do know that Allah Ta'ala, according to the Holy Quran, when he gives the good news to Maryam alayhi salam of the birth of his child, she says, Rabbi anna yakununi waladun walam yamsasni basha. She says, Oh my Lord, how can I have a son when no man has touched me? So in answer to that, Allah says to the archangel, gave her to the angel, says, what is this? No, no, no. No, 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 no. Said, even so, Allah creates what He wills. Whenever Allah decrees a matter, He merely says, Kun, be, and Fayakun. So, we have no idea about the Holy Ghost coming and doing His job, what He did or what He didn't do. Allah, for Bari, Allah Bari Ta'ala to create, He wills it, and the thing comes into being. There's no Holy Ghost anywhere that I can see. I don't see any Holy Ghost anywhere. With regards to the ayah, Allah says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا سَلَبُوهُ They didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. وَلَكِنْ شُبِّعَ لَهُمْ But it was made to appear to them. So, وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَقٍ مِّنْهُمْ And those who dispute therein are full of doubts. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمْ They have no certain knowledge. إِلَّا تِبَا زَنْ They only follow in conjecture, guesswork, fiction. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا For a surety, they killed him not. بَلْ رَفَعُ الله But Allah took him up to himself. That is what Allah says. They, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but Allah took him up to himself. This is my understanding. Allah took him up to himself, and he is coming back. He will come back. Inshallah. Who was, cru who was crucified? <laughs> that you go and ask your learned men. As far as the Christian is concerned, he is asking me, I answer him. This is, you are going into an entanglement yourself for no reason. Allah won't question you on the day of judgment, who was crucified? He tells you, I told you that Jesus was not killed and he wasn't crucified. He won't ask you who was crucified in his stead. That's not a part of your curriculum. So once you start wanting to fly, when you can't walk, you will trip and fall. You'll get hurt. There is a reference in the But sir, sir, we know that one person was crucified for sure. Uh, because who? Where did you get that? We know from... No, no, where do you know from? We know from history. Which history? Whose history? Who wrote that history? Some person. No, who? I can't, no, no, I can't, no. I can't put the Is name. it in the Quran? No, it's not. Is it in the Hadith? But that's why I'm asking. No, no, that, that's, there's, that's there's why nothing in the Hadith, there's nothing in the Quran who was crucified. So where are, where are you trying to trip yourself now? I want to know. No. Where did you get these ideas from? Sir, I can reply no. to him. We no. Know. I can no, no, please. This is not a... Uh, this is not a debate in society. I'm asking yeah. because of my curiosity. I want to know who was crucified if Jesus was not crucified. What does the Quran say? Quran says he was not crucified. Finish. That's all. Sir, I must respect and acknowledge your, your knowledge of the Bible. You know a lot more of the Bible than I know of the Quran, for sure. Um, I believe that as a Christian I have something to learn from the Quran. As far as I uh, recall, Islam means submission under the serenity will of God. And uh, actually that's my way in believing the Bible as the Word of God, to submit unto the authority of God. You have um, mentioned a number of difficulties in the Bible, and actually I could supply you with a lot uh, greater number of difficulties, which disturb me too, as a Christian. But my way to believe that still the Word of God is, um, I can't question the authority of Jesus as the Word of God. He acknowledges the authority of the scriptures, of the Old Testament. Um, he claims them to be infallible. Um, still, I have difficulties with it, but I have to submit under his authority. 
without the authority of uh, Jesus, if only I had the, the book, the words, I couldn't accept it as, uh, as infallible, as a word of God. As in the same way as I, if only I knew God from from the from uh, from the Bible, uh, from my life, from the world as we know it, I couldn't believe His love. Uh, there's too much in the deeds of God that disturbed me. But I can't question the love of Jesus. I have to I have to uh, acknowledge that He knows. Uh, he's the expert of love. If I compare his uh, expertise in love with my expertise in love, I have to accept that he knows a, a great more of it than I do. He knows the, the way of inspiration uh, in the Bible that I don't, I don't know. And I have to submit under his authority, uh, both as he uh, uh, claims the Bible to be infallible and he claims God to be love. Uh, so, even though I could uh, supply you with a great number of difficulties, of which some I could answer and some I can't, uh, a lot of your, your um, things I couldn't answer, uh, there are others I could, but uh, still that's not um, my uh, way of accepting the, uh, the Bible as God's Word. I have to submit under His authority. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your contribution you know, to the topic this evening. With regards to that idea of submitting to his will, I also believe that we must submit to the will of Jesus. Because he is not his will, is not his will. He says, the word ye hear are not mine. But the Father that sent me, he had given me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Even as the Father had said unto me, so I speak. So whatever he gives, if Jesus Christ gave you a word, if he told you, eat the pig, by all means, you can eat the pig. Because he was a man of God and he won't tell you any lies. So we are to follow him. If you are following him, I say follow him. To follow him now, he's telling you what to do. He's telling you, verily, verily I say unto you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no heaven for you. You're wasting your time. You say, no, I believe in his blood. He didn't say blood. In Matthew 11, 11, a learned man of the Jews comes to him and he says, good master, what good thing must I do to gain eternal life? So Jesus rebukes him. He said, why callest thou me good? There is none good except one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. If you were that young Jew, and if you were told, keep the commandments, what are the commandments? Everything that's given to you in the Old Testament. Commandments given through Moses. He gave you, you must eat the flesh of swine. You say, no, I will eat it. I love pork chops. What, what kind of a believer are you? He says, you must be circumcised. It's an eternal covenant God entered with Abraham and his descendants forever. You said, I'm not circumcised. Why aren't you? He said, the law is nailed to the cross. Is that what Jesus said? Jesus says, think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm come not to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. One jot, yot, in the Hebrew language is the smallest of the Hebrew alphabet. Not even that amount is to pass away from the law. But you have done away with oh, the whole law. So in other words, you are not following. Jesus says, follow the law, keep the commandments. But you say the law is nailed to the cross. I am asking, where did you get it? This idea of the law is nailed to the cross. You say Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians, Thessalonians. I say, who is that? You say, Paul, Paul. Paul, Paul, I want to know who is your Lord and Master. You say, Jesus. I say, what does Jesus say? Jesus is telling you, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. That's what he told his disciples. You haven't got that capacity. You are like little children. He's telling his disciples. But you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself. But what things so shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. 
Shouldn't you be looking for him, the spirit of truth? Who will guide mankind into all truth? We have so many problems affecting us, the whole world. Problem of racism, problem of alcoholism, problem of surplus women. What did the Holy Ghost tell any church in 2000 years? They are asking for solutions and they are not there. I said, the, the spirit of truth is Muhammad. He's given you solution to all your problems. Come, let us reason together. Let's reason together and you'll find that the spirit of truth that you are thinking about, talking about, is the prophet of truth. The word spirit is used synonymously in the Bible for a prophet. In the first epistle of John, chapter 4, verse 1, you read there. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. The false prophet is a false spirit, the true prophet is a true spirit. How are we to know the true from the false? The test is given to you. Is that the spirit that confesseth that Jesus is the Christ is of God. Am I right? Is that a valid test? You are being given clear cut, simple, basic English. The spirit, the prophet that confesseth, that says, that accepts that Jesus is the Christ, is of God. Am I reading correctly? Muhammad says, Jesus is the Christ. Masihu Isabnu Maryama. Christ Jesus, the son of Mary. 1,000 million Muslims of the world, they say, Jesus is the Christ. That spirit that moved Muhammad to say that is of God. According to the test given in your own Bible. But now, you are not prepared. It's not going down well. This is the trouble is, we are children of prejudices. We are all. We are subject to our programming. And the programming does not allow us that freedom to say, let's see now, let us analyze. What is this man trying to teach you, Muhammad? What is he trying to tell you? What did he tell you that is getting stuck in your throat? We want to know. If there is anything, he said, by the fruits you shall know them. By the fruits ye shall know them. Do men gather figs from the thistle of grace from the thorn? Say, so every good tree will be a good fruit and every evil tree will be evil fruit. The fruits of Islam are to be seen. We are not angels. But the biggest society of teetotalers in the world, biggest society of people who don't imbibe alcohol on earth today are the Muslims, good or bad. The biggest society of people who don't gamble are Muslims. The least racist of all communities on earth are Muslims. We are not free from racism. By God, we are not free. But the least racism of any community on earth are the Muslims. So by the fruits, you shall know them. So these are the fruits. Why don't you judge them by the fruits? Jesus said, judge them by the fruits. May I answer very shortly? Yes. Very shortly. Again, there are a lot of details in which I... Again, there are a lot of details in which I could agree and that, uh, uh, which I could answer. But just one detail. Actually, my justice does exceed the one of Pharisees. Anyone who knows me as a person would say, what? You have scolded your children this, uh, this very day uh, unjustly. Uh, unjustly. Um, and um, I have committed adultery in my thought, as Jesus co condemns. Have I kept the commandments? No, I haven't. But still my justice exceeds the one of Pharisees, the justification of faith, of which the New Testament teaches. Um, the gospel that Jesus preached was the one of the, uh, forgiveness. And that's my hope uh, and uh, my only hope to, to the Father. Thank you. Yes, uh, from the debate yesterday and uh, from the lecture today, I understand and I think the audience agrees with me that uh, you'll be studying the Bible very intensively and uh, also Bibles from different times. Uh, do you see any convergence in the revisions? I can't understand what you say. Well, I mean, uh, the different revisions which have taken place from all time and until now, do they lead to somewhere, to somewhere special? Is there any uh, special reason for these revisions over time? Where do, where do they want to lead us, the people who are trying to revise the versions of the Bible? They are trying to make things easy for you. 
From their point of view, they're trying to make things easy for you. That's what they're trying to do. But what we were proving was that this is not how God works. That your church committees, individuals, they don't form God. That's not the word of God. When they tell you what to do, what not to do, take this out, put this in. So we are try trying to prove to the audience that that is not the word of God when you do those things. What they are trying to achieve is they are trying to make things easy for you. So you may accept it far more easily. That's the only reason for it. You ask them. You ask them. No, no. Not here what, now. You, no? you You go to his church and you find out from him. <laughs> not here. Please be So that was the final question and the final answer for tonight. I thank you all very much. I thank the people who have taken trouble to arrange this meeting and everybody who came here and especially Sheikh Ahmed Didat for his knowledgeable contribution to our all, to our education. Thank you very much. Jazakum Allah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>